Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Smith, and I'm the faculty chair of the program in criminal justice. I am joined with my teammates here at the program, um, uh, Brian Welch, who is the program administrator, and, and uh, Katie Naples Mitchell, who's the program director. Um, we are happy to have you all join us again. Um, most of you have probably been joining us as a part of our Myths of Public Safety um, uh, speaker series event, um, which this semester is focused on on parole. Um, and in fact, uh, next week we begin, we, we continue our conversation around parole with Latoya Whiteside um, and Jasmine Borges, who will talk about um, parole and reentry starting from inside, how institutional rules, discipline and programs drive racial um, disparities in parole. Um, but we often, or at least maybe this is the third time this semester, we um, often pull back from our, our uh, the focus on parole, um, in part because, you know, as much as I think it's important for us to focus on these specific issues and, and really kind of think about them thoughtfully from various angles, it's hard to not want to pull in uh, the, the new research that's emerging from emerging scholars in the field who are doing really interesting and important research um, that we think should be a part of this conversation. For those of, of you who have joined us since uh, since 2020, um, where we focused on uh, reimagining public safety, you know that that has been a focus um, with particular interest in, in policing um, uh, at that point in time. I was very much interested in, in putting forward scholarship from folks who were rethinking what uh, how we could achieve public safety. Um, and during that time, I'd come to know about the research that was being done by a graduate student in the Department of Sociology, Jasmine Olivier. Um, she had been um, doing a case study on a specific housing project in Boston. Um, is historically rooted, but also um, considered what this had, uh, what the, the the implications were for the present moment. Um, and I found her research to be extraordinarily um, thoughtful, provocative, um, and timely. Um, it it spoke to so many of the issues that we were talking about in 2020, and that many people had been talking about well before. And I really thought that her research should be centered in so many ways because it was research that really, uh, really unpacked or showed a model for how it. It is that um, communities can center, um, 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 it can focus on and, and uh, achieve public safety through their own efforts, um, focusing on a, an effort that took place in one specific Boston public housing project. At the time, Jasmine wasn't necessarily ready to present her dissertation research, um, but as she's just mentioned, she has defended that research almost a year ago today and is now a research at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, working on a series of issues connecting poverty, inequality, homelessness, and, and um, the criminal legal system. Um, so because Jasmine is now in a place where she can talk about her research um, fully um, and share with us what she has learned from the really important um, work that she's doing, culling together semi-structured interviews, ethnographic fieldwork, archival research, police administrative research, um, from diverse public safety stakeholders, including police, social service providers, and uh, public housing staff and researchers, um, to, to offer us a, a, a different way of thinking about how we can achieve public safety. I thought it was really important to, to bring her back, if you will, to Harvard to share with us the important insights that she gleaned from her dissertation research um, and, and, and share with us how we can think about this. So much of our issues, I think, come from a, a space where we have a difficult time imagining what alternatives would look like. And in my mind, uh, Jasmine Olivier's research provides us with a way of thinking about and imagining a different way forward. So I welcome Jasmine um, Olivier to the pr program in criminal justice to, to share with us what it is she learned from her dissertation research. Uh, Jasmine will speak for about a half an hour or so, and then we will open it up to Q&A. Um, as always, um, don't hesitate to drop your questions in the chat as you have them. Um, if there are questions of, of clarification, I'm sure that Jasmine would be happy to take those, but maybe more, the questions of greater substance will hold on to those until after Jasmine gives her presentation. Uh, Jasmine, how about I turn it over to you now? Thank you for joining us. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was a very warm welcome. And I feel like you did such a great job at explaining my research that I don't know if I'm needed here today, <laughs> but just really, really excited to present on, um, you know, something that is a labor of love, but also a project that I'm extremely passionate about. And it feels really great to be in this space again, um, you know, having been in the program in criminal justice as a graduate student um, in the past several years. So thank you for having me here today. Um, today's talk is on a reimagined public safety through the case of the Bromley Heat Tenant Management Corporation. Um, and the picture that you see to the right is of uh, the Bromley Heath um, development, which in 1971 became the first um, housing development in the United States to be managed directly by residents. And this was unprecedented. And so as Sandra mentioned today, I will be talking about the formation of the Tenant Management Corporation. So how it came into being, um, the approaches that the resident managers took to public safety reform, as well as um, just what was responsible for its decline. And then ending with you know, some key takeaways on how this applies to the current discourse on reimagining a public safety. I did prepare a talk today that's approximately 40 minutes, so I will be mindful of time, um, but I start with background, um, then go into my research questions, the theoretical frameworks that undergird the research, my data and methods, findings, key takeaways, um, and then also the applied context of the work that I'm currently doing at Chapin Hall. Um, I end with Q&A, um, but as Sandra mentioned, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll try to also um, look at those as well. Um, and so some terms that I end up using um, a lot throughout today's talk are BHA, BPD, and TMC. And so I just wanted to list them out here just so that if I mention these right in reference to the Housing Authority, the Boston Police Department, or the Bromley Heat Tenant Management Corporation, you are aware of what I'm referencing. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. Um, the background and the rise of the Bromley Heat TMC. And so following widespread instances of police brutality, um, as well as poor living conditions within US public housing developments, we've seen communities of color engage in mass political movements, um, as well as just protests demanding better housing conditions, as well as protection from police violence. The 2020 killings of uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the more recent police killings of more black and brown persons um, of concentrated disadvantage have resulted in a call for reimagined public safety that puts historically disadvantaged communities at the forefront of public safety reform and systems change within government institutions. However, today's talk will demonstrate that the call for a reimagined public safety is not new. Um, the civil rights movement of the 60s into the early 1970s represented a shift in the national discourse that introduced community-centered solutions to public safety reform. In the late 1960s, with the sharp increase in safety and quality of life concerns within public housing, calls for community control and public housing management grew in intensity. Many public housing authorities neglected their responsibility to provide decent, safe, and sanitary living conditions for their residents. Likewise, disadvantaged public housing neighborhoods lacked police protection. For many black and brown communities, police violence was pervasive. In Boston in particular, in the face of neglect from the Boston Housing Authority and the Boston Police Department, the Black tenants of the Bromley Heath housing development took safety in, into their own hands. The residents protested their living conditions to city officials, engaged in mass cleanup efforts, started their own security patrol, and secured 600 signatures to launch a tenant management demonstration at Bromley Heath. In 1971, Brownlee Heath became the first tenant managed public housing development in the United States. And soon thereafter, we saw TMCs established in cities such as St. Louis, Chicago, New Jersey, amongst other cities. For the first time in US history, the federal government funded tenant management corporations where tenants were granted either partial or full control over managerial responsibilities. 
And so this picture that you see to the bottom right is actually a picture of the signing of the first contract between the Brownlee Heath TMC and the Boston Housing Authority. Julia Martin, who was a pioneer and former member of the Bromley Heath Tenant Management Corporation, speaks to the factors that led to the formation of the Bromley Heath TMC. In an interview with her, Martin stated, there used to be more whites than blacks here. When we moved in and they moved out, it became all blacks and they just weren't paying attention to this area. In the 60s, Bromley Heath started going down. This place was a wreck. The BHA didn't do anything. Broken windows, trash everywhere, drugs going rampant. We wanted our own security in here because we had none. Here, Julia Martin is referring to the decline in safety and quality of life at the Bromley Heath development in the late 60s. Within Boston public housing, with the increase in the non-white tenant population and the out-migration of white tenants, the BHA was notorious for its mismanagement and neglect of public housing residents. This was especially pertinent in a 1970 consultant report, which found that among several existing problems at the development were subpar management and maintenance, a deficiency in social services, poor uh, management tenant relations between the BHA and Bromley Heath residents, as well as a lack of security. Tenants cited drugs and gang violence among their primary safety concerns. And as was the case with the Boston Housing Authority, Consultants reported that the Boston Police Department neglected the Bromley Heath development as well. And this resulted in the creation of the Bromley Heath Tenant Patrol. And so according to Milton Cole, who was the founder of the Bromley Heath Tenant Patrol, Boston's black public housing residents experienced police neglect and police violence. Cole stated, we saw the things the police did. We saw the attack dogs, the helmets, and the shotguns, and it got to us. We felt we could take care of our own community and set up the patrol to protect ourselves from the police." End quote. And so the Bromley Heath Patrol, which was locally referred to as the Soul Patrol, was founded by Milton Cole as a voluntary operation in the 1960s and institutionalized in 1971 as a subdivision of the Bromley Heath TMC. The launch of the Bromley Heath Tenant Patrol was part of a larger movement towards community-centered approaches to public safety within cities such as New York City, Chicago, and Boston, amongst others. And dissatisfied with the quality of security provision in their neighborhoods, tenant patrols address public safety issues on their own terms. Combined, the accounts of TMC pioneers Julia Martin and Milton Cole demonstrate that the Bromley Heat TMC was born out of a shared desire for community control of public safety. This shared commitment of Bromley Heat residents to take control over their own safety and quality of life in the face of neighborhood decline reflects a large body of research on tenant activism within US public housing developments. Several of these studies indicate that from the 60s to the 1990s, residents of high poverty neighborhoods protested their safety and living conditions, formed tenant associations, tenant patrols, as well as informal tenant groups, primarily composed of black and Latina mothers who work to improve safety and quality of life within their neighborhoods. And so, you know, when we think of, you know, a lot of these issues. I think that one, one thing that is a through line um, in the quotes of Milton Cole and Julia Martin, and also is reflected in a lot of these um, scholarly texts that are displayed here, is that public housing residents possessed collective efficacy, which sociologists Robert Sampson and colleagues define as social cohesion, as well as shared expectations for social control within a given community. And in the case of Bromley Heath, strong collective efficacy amongst community residents was the foundation that led to the formation of the TMC. While there's already um, a large body of research on the presence of collective efficacy amongst groups of individuals or rather members of the same community, there's limited research on collective efficacy within community controlled organizations such as the Bromley Heat TMC. 
And despite the widespread use of the phrase reimagined public safety, there's a general lack of consensus on what this means, as well as a limited analysis of how community actors have historically employed innovative community-centered approaches to public safety. And so my research aims to contribute to the scholarly and policy discourse by asking the following research questions. And so first, what is a reimagined public safety from the perspective of community residents? residents? Secondly, from the 60s to 2012, so essentially from the inception to the dissolution of the Brahma Heat Team C, what community center strategies did the TMC employ to address public safety issues? And how does this compare to the strategies employed by state controlled institutions such as the BHA and the BPD? And third, what factors led to the decline of the TMC? The theoretical concepts undergirding the study include community control and collective efficacy. Community control refers to citizen power within institutions such as schools, police departments, and public housing developments. As the figure on the right suggests, community control, or rather what a legal scholar Arnstein calls citizen control, is the highest degree of power that community members can have within institutions. Whereas lesser degrees of power may consist of tokenism, for example, under citizen control, community members have agency over decision-making practices. Within the context of public housing, the establishment of tenant management corporations gave community residents an unprecedented level of control over managerial responsibilities. This was made possible through a contractual agreement between the tenant management corporation and the public housing authority, which outlined the responsibilities that each party was responsible for. In the case of the Bromley Heat TMC, this contractual agreement was between the TMC and the Boston Housing Authority. As a fully managing TMC, the Bromley Heat Tenant Management Corporation had control over most managerial responsibilities, which included um, the employment of staff, maintenance, construction and renovations, security provision, tenant recertification, tenant services, and more. Unlike the Boston Housing Authority, the Bromley Heat Team C was primarily staffed by residents and residents oversaw decision-making practices. At the top of the hierarchy was the board of directors, which was an elected body of tenants that was responsible for hiring and firing the director, addressing tenant concerns, as well as other responsibilities. As you'll note at the bottom right, protective services or rather the Brownlee Heath Patrol was under the direction of high level TMC staff. This differed from typical police community relations in that resident managers controlled the patrol officers' paychecks. The organizational structure of the TMC differed from that of the BHA in important ways. The TMC was decentralized, which allowed the managerial staff to make decisions on site at the development without the approval of a central bureaucracy. Under the TMC organizational structure, residents had greater control over managerial functions. And since the board of director was composed of residents, this meant that residents acted as a governing body that held the TMC management staff accountable to the needs of the tenant population. In contrast to the TMC's decentralized structure, the BHA maintained a bureaucratic organizational structure. BHA staff that were assigned to the various developments throughout Boston reported to the central BHA administration, which made all major managerial decisions. Included, included among the central administrative staff were the BHA administrator and historically speaking, an all white five member mayoral appointed board, um, which you see at the top. And so in contrast, uh, to the TMC, we see that there's divergent levels of community control under both organizational structures, which will be important in understanding how these different entities responded to public safety issues within the Bromley Heath development. 
And so as mentioned, collective efficacy amongst community residents was actually very crucial to the formation of the Brahma Heat TMC. Collective efficacy refers to community social cohesion coupled with community members' willingness to act on behalf of the common good. Samson and colleagues argue that collective efficacy is important for mediating the relationship between neighborhood disadvantage and violence. And within communities of high, with high levels of collective efficacy, there's a sense of mutual trust and shared expectations for social control that may be manifested through mechanisms such as monitoring and disciplining each other's children and intervening when people are involved in disruptive behavior. Nonetheless, while collective efficacy has its advantages, it may also limit community crime control efforts due to negotiated coexistence, or rather the set rules and expectations that may be formed between law abiding and crime involved persons living in the same neighborhood. This suggests that while collective efficacy has its benefits, strong social ties amongst neighbors may also hinder social control. Within the context of my dissertation study, I apply Samson's theory of collective efficacy to the case of public housing management. While I assess the relationship between collective efficacy and social control in this study, I also examine the ways in which collective efficacy shaped resident and staff perceptions of management effectiveness. And so I'm applying collective efficacy theory at the organizational level through the case of the Bromley Heat TMC. And so in terms of the data and methods, to answer my research questions, from February of 2020 to March of 2022, I conducted 67 semi-structured interviews with BHA and TMC staff, police officers, social service providers, as well as former and current Bromley Heath residents. I also engaged in over 90 hours of ethnographic observation, reviewed over 500 pages of archival data, and examined trends in police administrative data, and did a deep dive into the public safety and public housing literatures. In the interest of time, I don't elaborate on data analysis, sampling, or other aspects of the data and methods here, but would be happy to provide additional context during Q&A if there are any lingering questions. And here are my findings. First, what is a reimagined community-centered public safety from the perspective of community residents? In 2020, Miguel, a 25-year-old Latinx Bromley Heath resident, described to me what safety meant to him. He stated, quote, no one feels safe here. We're at the highest levels of unemployment we've ever faced since the Great Depression. COVID and its effect on people's level of income and intake of drugs and alcohol, food insecurity, these are all things that people in the projects deal with on a daily basis, amplified times 10. I've been in line at the food bank. I've had no money. I've almost been evicted many a time. I've seen what hunger, desperation, and honestly just being scared can do to a person. And so here I decided to keep the expletives in Miguel's quote because I believe that they speak to the passion with which he emphasized the ways in which food insecurity, unemployment, and housing precarity are also public safety issues that public housing residents um, nationwide experience on a regular basis. However, in addition to the structural disadvantages that Miguel argued impact his sense of safety, he also referenced direct experiences with police violence at Bromley Heath, one which reportedly occurred just a couple of weeks before our interview while he was experiencing a medical emergency. In describing an incident where he and his friends were allegedly assaulted by Boston Police Dep Department officers, Miguel stated, I came downstairs to greet my friends and as we were walking, an undercover cop came out of nowhere, grabbed me and threw me on a wall. I got laid out with my hands behind my back and one of my friends was getting choked out by the neck. What I found out afterwards was that they thought me having two white friends and a black friend who looked too nice for this neighborhood, they thought I was their drug dealer. And so they stopped us, they searched us violently and they broke all types of protocol, end quote. This reported experience of police violence not only shaped Miguel's perception of the police, but also the role of the police in assuring his safety. He stated, quote, 
the police's presence in this neighborhood never goes with safety. I'm scared of the cops. I can't be seen with them, end quote. And so sadly, Miguel, and if you recall, Bromley Heat tenant patrol founder Milton Cole were not the only residents to report direct and vicarious experiences with police violence at Bromley Heat. These data reinforce the importance of including protection against police violence as a part of a reimagined public safety. And so Miguel's quotes demonstrate that his sense of public safety expands beyond the traditional conceptualization, which is protection from violent crime. His sense of safety is also impacted by access to stable employment, housing, and food security, which aligns with an expansive view and conceptualization of public safety. Importantly, however, his sense of safety is also impacted by experiences of police violence in this neighborhood. And so I argue that a reimagined public safety not only prioritizes our physiological, economic, physical, and mental well being, but also ensures our protection from state induced violence. The US government has played a role in assuring uh, bar, uh, safety from bodily and property harm um, for citizens as early as the late 1700s. But what happens when the state is responsible for invoking harm? And so to this point, a reimagined community-centered public safety must expand beyond violent crime. A reimagined community-centered public safety is one that is trauma-informed, prioritizes community health and well-being, includes protection from police violence, and addresses systemic inequities through community-based interventions. In light of this conceptualization of a reimagined public safety, I ask, how did the Bromley Heat team see work to address public safety concerns within the Bromley Heat development? And how did this compare to the strategies employed by the Boston Housing Authority and the Boston Police Department? And so I find that the Bromley Heat team see preferred rehabilitative alternatives to arrests and evictions for criminal activity. The Bromley Patrol acted as an intermediary between the Boston Police Department and Bromley tenants. They used their discretion in when to involve the police. To this end, Milton Cole, the founder of the TMC Patrol, stated, quote, when the police responded, we monitored their calls. The police began to respect this, and a decision was made by the patrol sergeant to stay out of the area, only coming in when they were needed. We would try to get residents straighted out before the police got involved and gave them a record, end quote. The Brown Heat Patrol conducted daily vertical patrols in the buildings, hallways, and stairwells, reported cases of vandalism and maintenance concerns to TMC management. And in addition, each building was assigned a building captain who was responsible for monitoring the cleanliness of the hallways, stairwells, elevators, as well as apartment units. And so this was a community-based and community-wide effort um, for social control. Due to the Brown Heath TMC's service-oriented makeup, as well as a strong social ties amongst Brown Heath residents, the TMC connected at-risk and crime-involved residents with social service programming, such as substance abuse treatment for nonviolent drug offenses. And so a quote from a former Bromley police chief, Joseph Macaluso, further highlights the TMC's reported rehabilitative approach to public safety. He stated, quote, TMC Director Mildred Haley wasn't pro-police. She didn't want to see people get arrested. Rather than to arrest youth, we would coordinate with a lot of different agencies, social services, and school departments really trying to ramp down activities before they became major. And to this point, Mildred Haley, the late Mildred Haley herself, described her reimagined approach to public safety reform, stating, we now have more people working, going to school, and a strong community spirit because we did it ourselves. We brought in job referral and training, a daycare center, the health center, and negotiated with the TMC, we measure our accomplishments and the changes in people more than in management and personal care. The kinds of services developed, 
who provided them, and service monitoring all came from a community base. And so in expanding on Haley's description of the public safety framework at Brownlee Heath, the Brownlee TMC partnered with on-site and local social service agencies to cater to tenants' public safety needs. This included providing access to healthcare and nutrition, education, child care and child welfare services, youth recreation, substance abuse, and employment and security and trauma response services. On the right are some of the on-site and local ser service programs that service the Brown Heath community. And as was the case with at Brown Heath, social service provision was central to the makeup of most tenant management corporations across the nation. It was part of public housing and tenants' collective efforts to improve neighborhood outcomes. Jasmine, can I jump mm -hmm. in for a sec? Um, we are hearing a, a bit of an echo um, that started a couple minutes ago. I'm not sure if you changed anything about how you were communicating with us, but there's a there's an echo. And so I'm wondering if there's something that's happening on your end. Oh, no, it, it very well may be. I uh, have a uh, deck set up, and I wonder if that's what's happening. Um, I could try to join additionally from my phone and present that way if that may help. Apologize for the inconvenience. No, no. Um, apologies for uh, jumping in and, and uh, breaking your flow. Um, let's see. Perhaps what you can do is to finish the presentation and then wh while we transition to Q&A, maybe you can pop off and then pop back on. That way we can deal with the, the echo noise at that point. How about that? Sounds good. And apologies again. Um, and if there's anything that's unclear about, you know, what I'm saying, um, and it's pre pre uh, presenting too much of um, a distraction, feel free to let me know and I will um, change course. So thank you. Okay, so, you know, another important finding, right, is that in, a, in contrast to the TMC's reported rehabilitative approach, the BHA and the BPD employed retributive approaches to public safety issues during this time frame. During the war on drugs of the 80s and in the 1990s, with the federal punitive crime policies such as HUD's one strike and you're out eviction policy and its anti-drug abuse campaign, public housing authorities and police departments nationwide took an increasingly punitive approach to public safety concerns through arrests and evictions. Crime data indicate that during this time frame, drug arrests skyrocketed and Blacks were disproportionately arrested for drug violations in comparison to their non-Black counterparts. Between 1995 to 1999, non-Hispanic Blacks composed approximately 57% of drug arrests in Boston public housing despite only accounting for approximately 36% of the total tenant population. Non-Hispanic Blacks were also three times more likely to be arrested for a drug violation than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. In addition to arrests, the BHA allegedly took an increasingly punitive approach to evictions for presumed illicit activity. These newspaper clippings demonstrate the divergent of approaches to evictions between the BHA and the TMC. Um, and so the BHA, uh, between 1997 to 98, had 77 drug related evictions filed at the Bunker Hill development, which is comparatively sized to the Brown Heath development. During the same time frame, the Brown Heath TMC only sought for drug-related evictions. And so there you see that there was a huge contrast in how they approached um, evictions for presumed illicit activity. And so while the restorative justice or rehabilitative practices of the TMC had their advantages, they ended up causing strife with state actors like the Boston Police Department and the Boston Housing Authority. This was especially the case following a federal drug raid at the development in 1998, where 28 residents, including two of Brown Lee TMC director Mildred Haley's grandsons, were arrested on drug charges. 
This raid led to the one-year takeover of management by the DHA and the permanent dissolution of the Brown Lee Patrol. At the root of the tension between state and community-controlled approaches to public safety was a notion of deservingness. In other words, how many chances do public housing tenants deserve for their infractions? While the BHA perceived the TMC as giving tenants too many chances, the TMC perceived the BHA as not giving tenants enough chances. But I must also uh, state that beyond the rehabilitative philosophy of the TMC, the negotiated coexistence of tenant managers and residents whom they had pre-existing social ties to may have also played a part in the TMC's softer approach to social control. This is especially pertinent in thinking of the potential conflicts of interest in tenant management invoking infractions or friends and other family members who resided at the development. And so with this in mind, what factors led to the decline of the Brownlee TMC? I argue that the decline in the Brownlee TMC can be attributed to the decline in collective efficacy amongst community residents, the decline in organizational leg legitimacy and support for tenant management as a whole, as well as strained relationships between the Boston Housing Authority and the Brown Lee TMC. Relations between the BHA and the TMC never quite recovered after the 1998 drug rate and temporary takeover. Even upon regaining control of the Brown Lee development, relations were so rocky that in 2006, the TMC and BHA worked on a proposal for direct HUD oversight, which would relieve the BHA of its contractual ties to the development. And this was the first time actually in US history that this was even proposed. It wasn't successful, but they did propose um, to relieve the BHA of its oversight or the contractual ties to the TMC. Additionally, as the development's Hispanic population grew, tensions mounted between the predominantly African-American TMC staff and the Hispanic, Hispanic tenant population. In 2010, Hispanic tenants accused the TMC of a preferential treatment of Black Americans, which prompted a civil rights investigation. With fragmented relationships between tenant management and Brown Lee residents, the collective efficacy that was integral to the success of the TMC had dissipated. Many of the residents who supported the TMC had moved, aged, and or passed away. And so from this, what can we take away from the case of the Brown Lee TMC? Despite its pitfalls, the Brown Lee TMC adopted a reimagined approach to public safety at a time when the federal government and law enforcement agencies deployed a top one crime approach. The TMC focused on addressing the structural inequities that gave rise to the crime. This included the provision of security as well as social services by the community for the community. And so here I say and argue, right, that a reimagined public safety invests in community-based interventions, right, that are community controlled, addresses the root causes of the crime, accounts for social service needs, protects communities from harm, which includes police violence, and values the lived expertise of community residents. Today, with the call for a reimagined public safety, Cities nationwide are reassessing city budgets with some real reallocating funds from police departments or other city um, agencies to community-based organizations, as well as alternative crisis response teams. Others are expanding their public safety plans to address homelessness, food insecurity, and other structural inequities that disproportionately impact marginalized communities. In assessing the impact of community-based public safety interventions, I argue that scholars and policymakers should think expansively about what metrics to determine a program or an intervention's success. Violent crime measures alone are insufficient. 
depending on the intervention, there may also be other metrics such as employment, housing stability, food security, health and wellness, and others used to determine or to evaluate rather a program's effectiveness. And so an example that I will be presenting on our next slide is a current project that I'm co-leading, a direct cash transfer housing intervention that is a component that is known as the Trust Youth Initiative. And so this is a part of the work that I do at um, Chapin Hall. And so the Trust Youth Initiative was launched in New York City in 2021 as a first of its kind pilot program aimed to help transitional age youth ages 18 to 24 to exit homelessness. Currently, 49 youth receive monthly cash payments and a one-time enrichment fund of $3,000 that they can withdraw at any time during the 24 months that they're enrolled in an intervention. They also have access to optional support services and case management supports, which include counseling on public housing, public benefits, um, housing navigation, education and career support, and more. This intervention was co-designed with young people with lived experiences of homelessness, as well as city government officials and experts in youth and young adult homelessness. The support of city government officials, local CEOs, and funders has grown so much that we've been able to expand the Trust Youth Initiative to two counties in Minnesota, to Oakland, California, to San Francisco, and a growing number of cities where this is being developed. And so in assessing how legislators, funders, and city governments can invest in innovative approaches to public safety reform, I argue that direct cash transfer interventions that pair financial as well as social service supports are a promising approach to public safety reform. And so with that being said, I want to thank you for um, listening to my presentation today um, and would like to open up the floor to Q&A. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that terrific presentation. So what, perhaps we'll get started with uh, um, Terrence. T Terrence Gilchrist, would you like to ask your question? Would you like me yes. to ask it for you? Yes, thank you. Um, thought it was a great presentation. Really enjoyed your insights uh, and the depth of your analysis. Uh, my question probably has two parts. Uh, the first, uh, very general, I guess, what kind of technical assistance did the TMC receive, um, as well as management training? And my question is not from a, like a deficit um, model of their competency. I'm sure a number of those residents had skills, but managing a complex a housing development is an undertaking. Um, there's many factors to consider, um, compliance, control, um, civil rights, uh, some of the issues that arose later on in the 90s. Um, so, and again, just what kind of training did they receive? And a related question, specifically to the narcotics trafficking, um, and the question may be provocative, but there is a movie called Serpico that touched upon this. Sometimes those who are involved in law enforcement are actually creating the harm, creating the problem, and are, to just be very blunt, they are selling drugs or giving protection to those who are doing the narcotics trafficking. Uh, so given that, how did the TMC, if they're even aware of that kind of matter, how do they negotiate that with those who they could trust in law enforcement or in other parts of uh, the city apparatus or state apparatus, county apparatus, or those stakeholders whom they could trust, given that narcotics trafficking is not something that's just a simple matter of those who are selling drugs and those who are to protect us when those who are protecting us are actually involved in ensuring the perpetuation of that narcotics trafficking. Thank you, Terrence, for those really great questions. Um, you know, I'll start with the first one on the technical assistance piece. And so, you know, I wasn't able to fully flesh this out in the presentation, but something that I, you know, explore more in the dissertation research is just really kind of the integral steps that took place before the tenant management was actually incorporated in 1971. Um, and so they started with a, a demonstration project, which 
basically was the time where they had to prove that they would be equipped to actually handle this huge undertaking. Um, this included receiving um, training as well as technical assistance from the Boston Housing Authority. Um, and so they worked very closely with the BHA to really kind of learn the structure of like what it really takes um, in terms of the different aspects of, you know, collecting a rent, thinking about arrears, thinking about um, how to handle other issues, right? And I think part of what ended up causing conflict between the Boston Housing Authority and the TMC is that, you know, essentially the TMC was supposed to abide by the regulations that, you know, all BHA developments have to kind of undergo, which again, were also kind of like, given to them through, or through direct oversight from HUD, right? And so um, TMC kind of broke away from that to some degree. They, they, they cited organizational mismanagement became an issue, um, was an issue um, arguably throughout, but became a major issue, um, especially in the 2000s and something that really kind of like, you know, left, I guess, a sour taste in um, the, the mouths of the Boston Housing Authority, the federal government, um, and led to really strained relationships. And so, you know, when I talked about that time in 2006 where the BHA and the TMC were trying to basically cut ties with each other, this was in part because of that. There was, you know, a disagreement on how to, you know, effectively manage the development and the TMC allegedly kind of wanted to do things differently than what was expected of them through protocol. And so I wanna say that, you know, the TA, uh, pro provision is something that definitely occurred at the inception. Um, but after the 1998 takeover that happened, that drug raid that I referred to in that one year takeover, there was a lot more oversight of the TMC by the BHA, right? It wasn't like, here's, we're giving it back to you. We're not going to like really kind of surveil what you're doing. And speaking to um, former um, tenant management corporation staff, they told me about basically they had um, re recurrent meetings where they had to basically meet with BHA and kind of show them what they're doing, show them their numbers and basically prove that they're equipped to handle this responsibility. Um, and so hopefully that gives some context as to that first question. Um, your second question in, in regards to, you know, the very real, um, you know, uh, consideration um, in the U.S. of thinking about public housing, um, not public housing, but law enforcement agents can be responsible for actually, um, you know, I would say kind of extending crime or not crime, but like harm really within communities. Um, you know, I can't say um, too much about whether that was the case at Bromley Heath, you know, the archival data, the interviews and the information that I was able to gather didn't necessarily, you know, point to that being the major concern or that being the reason per se why the uh, patrol was uh, dissolved. Um, but at the same time, when that drug rate happened in 1998, um, there was um, an general uh, um, over overview of like police officers who worked at the development saying that they received a lack of support from the tenant management corporation in order to pursue arrests and evictions. And so that is something that came up um, and that there was, uh, you know, uh, just disagreement amongst um, the chief, not the chief that I talked about in the presentation, but the succeeding chief um, and, you know, the TMC director on how to approach these issues, right? Um, it's reported at least that they wanted to evict some people who were involved in drug um, drug sales for an extended period of time, but were not able to because they had to kind of go through this bureaucracy of tenant management. But then again, I also spoke to officers who were there at the time who said that there was a lot more of what was going on. And it also included um, just kind of a fragmented relationship between the Boston Housing Authority, including their own police department that was in existence at the time. And then the Bromley Heath, you know, patrol, albeit much smaller, but there was already that, that tension. And so there were a lot of politics involved in this, um, you know, dis dissolution of the Bromley Heath patrol. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to speak out of turn and say that, you know, that that was the exact reason why um, it didn't work out. Hopefully those that answers your questions. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. That was great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Parents, thank you for such a terrific set of questions. 
Uh, so while we wait for others to join the chat, um, quick question, uh, Jasmine. I think you do an extraordinary job of highlighting what was happening in the local context um, to make sense of the changes, both the emergence of uh, community policing in Bromley Heath and, uh, and also its decline, right? So you get a sense of the major institutions that were involved, the conflicts that led both to its emergence and its uh, erosion. But I'm wondering if we can place this in the broader historical context, right? Um, so this is the era of mass incarceration. If we were to take seriously, as I think we should, Elizabeth Hinton's work. Um, mm -hmm. We understand this as a moment when the federal government effectively helps to fund um, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, um, policing of Black and Brown communities, especially low-income communities, especially in urban areas, uh, places that look a lot like um, the neighborhood um, and the public housing project that you studied. It's difficult to imagine um, or understand, it, it seems to me that it would be difficult to understand what happened with Bromley Heath without having as a backdrop um, that broader understanding. So I'm wondering, would Bromley Heath have taken place had it not been, and I know we can't really answer this question, right? What would be the counterfactual if, it ha if there had not been a broader um, project of mass incarceration of black and brown bodies, um, the kind of people that look exactly like those that you uh, spoke to and studied for your dissertation project. So can you connect, an excellent job with providing historical context for understanding this, can you connect it to the broader context of mass incarceration itself? That is a really poignant question, uh, Sandra. And I, you know, just to speak to that, you know, I guess my short answer is yes. I do think that the Bromley Heath TMC would be in existence, but it's not necessarily because I don't think that, you know, these issues that you mentioned around mass incarceration and all of these things didn't actually have an influence in their public safety behaviors, but more so that these were issues that they were dealing with before what we call now to be the war on drugs, what we call now to be, you know, the the the, the carceral turn and, you know, this, the, the advent of mass incarceration as we know it today. You know, I think, you know, especially in those quotes that I shared from Milton Cole and Julia Martin, but there were others, you know, uh, pioneers that I also spoke to and have archival data for that basically expressed that they were having these issues way before like this was even the discussion, right? I mean, this really started in like the 50s and the 60s for them, um, dealing with um, racism, dealing with police violence, um, dealing with a lot of these, these issues. Um, and so, you know, I think that it did propel their decision to want to take matters into their own hands. Um, but when we think about the historical backdrop that you mentioned around, you know, just the conditions and the contextual, the contextualization of like what was happening at that moment, I think that it did have an impact as we see in terms of how the TMC um, adopted a more rehabilitative approach and disagreed with HUD's, you know, one strike and year out eviction policy and all of these punitive measures that were put in place. Um, but this work, this social service work, this like adoption of a reimagined approach started long before that was even a conversation. So that's my take on it, um, especially because, you know, while this presentation starts at like the 60s and, you know, a lot of what I, you know, found in terms of the reports and what led to this desire to, you know, control the community started even beforehand um, when uh, the few black residents that moved into Bromley Heath in the 50s were there and just saw the conditions of, you know, how they were treated, what was going on. And so this is longstanding. It's been an issue that's been going on for, for decades, sadly, right? Um, but I think that that is how I would, you know, kind of frame um, their uh, proclivity to, you know, a, a, a rehabilitative approach to public safety. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for that. So we have at, at least two folks um, um, in line. Um, first, there's Claire Barker, who um, asked a, a question about size. Um, Claire, would you like to ask your, your question? And then after Claire, Jackie has her hand up. Um, so first, Claire. Okay, so, so Claire might have had to go. Claire asks um, uh, about, give me one second, forgive me, everyone. Um, 
Is there any indication that size matters in the TMC approach? In other words, perhaps easier to do in a smaller setting than very large developments. Do you mind repeating the question? I just wanna make sure I understand. Yeah, not a problem. So Claire asks, is there any indication that size matters in the TMC approach? In other words, perhaps it's easier to do in a smaller setting than in very large developments. Mm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I mean, um, the Bramley Heath development is uh, definitely one of the largest, if not the largest development um, in Boston, in the Boston under Boston Housing Authority. I mean, I think it's like, a comparatively sized to the Bunker Hill development, but it's about 23 acres of land. That's definitely no small fee, right? When you think of managing um, just that, um, those many numbers of, you know, buildings, that many um, residents. Um, and, you know, I mean, perhaps it is the case that it would have been more manageable had it been smaller. Um, there was a report that came out in the 90s uh, where HUD, um, did a, um, an evaluation of tenant management corporations across the nation. Um, some of them were, you know, different in size. And also um, there were differences in terms of, you know, just the level of control that um, tenant management had, right? Whether it be partial, which means that they kind of were co-managing along with the housing authority or having full uh, control of management. Um, and then they did find in that report that, you know, in cases where there was partial management, that it was um, a bit easier for them to kind of um, invoke certain like uh, safety reforms and things of that sort, because they had the, you know, support of the housing authority, right? And I think that goes back to um, Terrence's question around technical assistance and just the huge um, um, uh, uh, the huge lift that it is to manage a housing development, um, and especially with, you know, per perhaps previously limited knowledge and training on how to do so. Um, but I think that the problem ex expended or extended beyond the size. I think there were several things, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, there was a, a large period of time in which there was like widespread support for the TMC you know, which lasted for, for decades, right? After that, um, that uh, take, temporary takeover, uh, residents actually protested and chanted outside of the BHA office, like, we want the TMC back, right? And so there was support for it, and, you know, and it was, you know, seemingly, seemingly successful for a long period of time. And so it's hard to say that it was size um, in and of itself that led to its decline. I think that there were other issues, especially, you know, in thinking back from a sociological perspective, like ethno, um, the ethnic heterogeneity, um, just, you know, differences in frames around the TMC and its value. Like these are things that also played a part um, that I think are also important for us to keep in mind when we think about, you know, why it might not, you know, why it's still not in existence today. So. Thank you so much for that, Jasmine. So now, Jackie, would you like to ask your question? I'm trying to give you my face just a second. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for this, uh, Jasmine. And I, I'm hopeful that I can get a copy of your dissertation. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I work, I teach at UMass Boston and I teach police and society. And these are the issues that we keep looking at is especially in light of defunding, right? Um, and what does that mean? Um, and so what what can it look like, right? And so I think what I'm, I'm hopeful to do when I look at all your data is uh, see, see what lessons we can learn from what happened with the TMC identify where the issues were, address those mm -hmm. issues. And then I think, and, and, I, and maybe I'm, I miss applying things, um, but I'm thinking that it can be applied district by district in, um, in Boston because those neighborhoods in each, each district are unique. They're not necessarily homogenous, but they're unique. Um, and it could be, um, I'm just thinking there's a lot of lessons we can get from your research that can help us find why are it, and I also wanna give you the background where I used to work in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so when I 
knowing the calls for service that we would get from the community was amazing, right? From bark, barking dogs to, <laughs> you know, vandalism that, can, can how can a, a community have a place so that um, when they call 911, they get diverted to a, a community a, a program or organization like TMC that can do this without criminalizing the, the uh, individuals or residents that this issue, because as long as humans are living together, we're going to have conflict, but then how can we handle those without calling 911, mm -hmm. especially in communities that are undersourced? That so, is a really great point. Um, sorry to cut you off. Um, no, no, no. Really you need to cut me off because I'll just keep on talking. So. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I mean, honestly, I'm really glad that you asked that question. Um, you know, I didn't give this context, but, you know, prior to even starting this dissertation research, I, you know, studied the Boston Police Department for years. Uh, my dissertation chair, Chris, here knows that very, very well. Um, but, you know, so when I think about 911 call diversion, I mean, it's still definitely an area that's growing in research and, you know, something that I would like to give further attention to, to be able to kind of like, you know, just really um, thoroughly answer that question. But I do think that it's possible, right? And how, how can we think about alternative crisis um, response systems to non you know, violent uh, offenses, right? Like how could there be like um, calls directed for, you know, mental health crises, calls directed for other sorts of um, crises that don't necessarily require police presence. Um, you know, I don't know if you recall earlier in the presentation, I talked about how, you know, Milton Cole, when they, you know, established that tenant patrol that then became, a, you know, a part of the Bromley Heat TMC, um, that they actually kind of monitored the calls of the police. They had a dashboard. So if a call came in, they were the intermediary and would say, okay, is this a call where we actually, you know, need to like, you know, involve, you know, the police and have them come in and perhaps this can cause even further harm or can we try to take care of this ourselves and then, you know, call if we really do need that support. I mean, so this is just one example of how that was actually a system that at least was in place in the 1970s. Um, I would definitely like to give further thought to like how we might think through that um, in a contemporary perspective, though I do know that there are cities that are adopting this approach of 911 call diversion. And so I, you know, I, I just don't have enough context as to like the effectiveness of this um, on a, you know, citywide or, or even nationwide level, but um, appreciate the question is definitely food for thought. Yeah, and just one added component. I, um, one of my former students is in, um, immersed in restorative practices and transformative practices in, in the Boston area, um, Dorchester primarily. Um, but she has a nonprofit now called Unity Circles, and they are working with young people on how to resolve using um, restorative justice in their communities addressing and I mean it hasn't been scaled up they're 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 working with um I think it, uh, young adults from like 17 to 28 but if you're interested in any of her work I, you know just let me know for certain I'm always interested in um connecting with others who are you know in this space and passionate about this line of work so thank you for that um that that connection thank you so much Jackie so um, a question, uh, uh, Jasmine, for me. Um, so you're, the focus of your research is on uh, public housing um, um, development. Um, and many of the discussions from the 1960s, 70s forward have been about public housing um, developments and tenant management corporations that are associated with them. Um, but most people don't live in public housing, right? Um, but many people still, uh, struggle with issues of public safety broadly defined, um, as you rightfully, uh, rightly broadly define it. Um, so then my question is, how do we imagine what it is you're describing outside of the context of public housing? Because one can, one senses that there, there is a way that being connected to housing, um, um, public housing or social housing made uh, or facilitated a development of the the kind of tenant associations and the you know there was a way in which they drew from the uh, um, some of the resources from 
uh, the um, Boston Housing Authority, et cetera, in order to kind of develop their own corporation, drew some, some resources, et cetera. What would this look like outside of the context of a public housing um, 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 proud project or social housing? Um, it, it, I think m much of this discussion has been premised on the idea that that's what we're thinking about looking at. But many of the problems that you've described uh, happen outside of those contexts um, and still, one could argue, require um, community oriented uh, and centered public safety. Can you can you share some thoughts about that? Um, did you come across those kinds of efforts or efforts in those kinds of contexts and while doing your research? Yeah, that's a really great question. I'm glad that you asked it because, right, like thinking about just the scalability and like just thinking about how important it is to be able to adopt some sort of community-based approach um, outside of just the realms of public housing. I will say, at least from my research that I've done, you know, over the course of several years in Boston, that there are like you know, safety uh, local tenant organizations and safety meetings that occur even outside of the bounds of, of public housing. I lived in Dorchester for a while and, you know, went to my local neighborhood safety meeting, but there are so many of those that exist all across the city. And I would like to, you know, presume that this occurs um, in cities nationwide, right? That these types of meetings occur, right? So I think that there are spaces um, and like, um, where community members are invested in the decisions that impact their lives, that there are spaces that already exist where they can be propelled to um, basically be the pioneers of certain um, community-based alternatives. Um, but also at the same time, I think that um, having local community-based organizations that you know do this type of work are able to provide service provision that are able to connect um, residents with resources should be kind of at the helm of our discussion on um, a reimagined public safety because something that I noted and I think it's important to you know really just kind of be transparent about is that at least in the case of the TMC, right, you have this strongly knit community where it does pose a conflict of interest if it's your grandson that is involved in something or if it's, you know, your, you know, resident, your neighbor that you've known for 30 years. And I think that can occur regardless, but it's like, I think if we put invest resources, financial and otherwise, um, through city, you know, city government and things like that, into community-based um, um, interventions that we know have the potential to work and that maybe already have success records, that that might be an area for us to start thinking about um, how this work can expand and scale that is not necessarily, that involves the input of community residents, that involves um, in residents in the co-design of certain, um, you know, interventions and things like that, as I did mention with the work that I do now, right? So involving community and having community input, um, but also having the organizations perhaps be at the helm of that social change. So that's just the initial thought that comes to mind when you ask that question, because, you know, I know that there are organizations like that out there who are doing amazing work that are trying to uh, hit at many of these issues that we're discussing. And so what could be possible if they're given the necessary resources, perhaps the necessary technical assistance and all of these things in order to scale their work, in order to um, basically touch the lives of others in a more positive and impactful way. Thank you for that. Um, and finally, uh, you talked about the role of mothers in uh, the, the success, uh, the emergence of the uh, TMC and the related uh, community-centered uh, public safety approaches. Can you share more about the central role that women and mothers have play, played, not just in this context, but broadly speaking, questions of public safety? I think it's interesting because I don't know that we always think about women as being centered in these kinds of projects, um, but when we think deeply about it, women are often um, the, the center of these kinds of efforts. So can you share a bit more about the role that women played and perhaps um, um, take a, a minute or so um, extra to suggest ways in which the these projects or the roles that were associated that with them were gendered? Because I'm assuming that um, women did play really important roles, but, that I'm, but men must have also had roles that they played so that this 
it was a, uh, you know, a, a true community effort. So can you tell us more about the, the, the role of gender in shaping um, these kinds of organizations? Absolutely. Um, well, I guess I will start first by just kind of thinking through what at least I know to be the case at Bromley Heath. And I think just in reading, you know, the public housing literature from, you know, um, scholars like Lawrence Vale and others on like what conditions were like during that time, what the demographic makeup of public housing was, is that it pr was predominantly of mothers, of single mothers, right? And this time period, especially um, of the 60s onward, um, that was the primary demographic of, 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 of households. And so it very well may be the case that, you know, you see more, um, you know, activism in the case of mothers because they made up the majority of um, public housing residents. But I think that it's, it's way beyond that. I think that you know, mothers really wanted the best conditions for their children, that they, they were invested in making sure that safety and that, you know, providing that social safety net, as we, you know, describe in this reimagined public safety would be, um, you know, provided so that their children would not be at risk of danger. Um, you know, I was so um, impassioned by speaking to, you know, pioneers and people that, you know, uh, helped to found the TMC, for example. Um, so Julia Martin is one example, but I spoke to many others, um, you know, who are still here with us. And Julia Martin talked about the Mothers for Action before the TMC even was created. The Mothers for Action was advocating for social service provision within the community. They helped to bring in the Martha Elliott Health Center. They started their own daycare that was them taking shifts to watch each other's children so that they could go to work that they could go to the doctor if they needed to. They watched each other's children. And so this is, you know, again, speaking to that collective efficacy aspect of what I discussed earlier in the talk, um, but this was not unique to Bromley Heath. Um, you know, in reading the, the works of other scholars, um, you know, that I kind of, you know, showed their, their work on that previous slide, like this was happening nationwide. Um, you know, there's work in, uh, around Baltimore, mothers who actually advocated for uh, change within uh, public housing so that they could have better safety and like living conditions and they protested as well. Um, in New York City public housing, scholars speak about how local tenant associations were formed, and a lot of them were also like by mothers as well, like Mama's Mafia and some other names of, you know, just mothers coming together to fight for what, whether it be, we need to put bars in the windows so that our children are not, you know, at risk of falling out, right? Which was an instance that actually happened, right? Like, how can we make sure that we can protect our children? Um, in fact, this is not something I spoke about today, but um, in, in an interview with Milton Cole, he spoke to um, how mothers were actually very crucial in the formation of the tenant patrol. He said that those women walked around with bats and they were not to be messed around with, that they were also very involved in, you know, that volunteer patrol. They were, you know, making sure the children were, you know, staying in line, right? And so I just say that all to say that this was, you know, the role of mothers is something that definitely cannot be overlooked as we think about um, tenant activism, as we think about um, just safety reform. And I think that this is just indicative of a larger, um, perhaps sat to, 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 a, to a sad point, to some degree, we, you, we focus on men and the, the contributions of men to the civil rights movement and you know, all of these major movements, but women played an integral role that also can not be overlooked. And so maybe I sound very passionate about it, I am, um, but I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> no question whatsoever. Well, I think <laughs> it strikes me that this is a great place to end. A strong woman talking about strong women um, and the work that they do to affect change in their communities. Jasmine, thank you so much for, for coming and, and sharing with us uh, your really important and powerful research. So appreciate it. Really look forward to seeing what else comes comes out of the shops that you are a part of. Um, and I, it sounded like there's a lot of interest in reading your dissertation. Um, I want everyone to know that I've been encouraging um, Jasmine to turn her dissertation into a book, book project. So hopefully we'll see that at some point in the near future. All the best. And um, well, I'm hoping we'll stay in touch. So um, thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So we'll see everyone next week. Goodbye and have a good evening. Take care. Right, bye everyone. <laughs>